welcome back. Did you enjoy your activities? Clap, clap, clap. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Ramon. <laughs> Very much appreciated. <laughs> I still remember uh, the first time I saw Anna giving a talk, Anastasia. We were at ThoughtWorks in Munich, and uh, she was uh, giving this talk on Scrum and Agile testing, and I was awestruck. She has a great uh, stage presence, but also the concepts uh, she was explaining, they were, I mean, in a way, they felt kind of obvious, like all good things look obvious, but they are not, especially in our field. Sometimes they get um, forgotten. And uh, at that time, she was working at Sync, and I'm now very happy to say that she's my colleague. So she is at Freeletics right now, and she is helping us improving our uh, quality culture, um, helping the teams uh, getting into the concept of the whole team testing, and uh, she's doing a great, great job there. Her talk is named Improving Development Quality and Speed with Agile Testing, and she'll share her point of view and her techniques as an Agile tester to help us discover risks early in the development cycle in order to release products of great quality and make it such that the whole team is included when testing. Here it is, Anastasia Chiku. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, man, it's really loud in here. Yeah? You can hear me, right? All good? Good. On July 23rd, 1983, an Air Canada flight between Montreal and Edmonton had to stop midway because they ran out of fuel. Now, this is a highly regulated industry, and these guys knew exactly how much fuel they needed. Also, the amount of fuel was indicated correctly in the documentation for the flight in kilograms, and it was loaded in pounds, which led to less than a half of the amount of fuel to be available for the flight. Now, this kind of miscommunications happen so often that I'm pretty sure that you experienced one today. We, as humans, tend to miscommunicate, misjudge, misplan. Actually, for the planning, there is even a term for that. It's called the planning fallacy. We tend to be extremely optimistic when it comes to the future and tend to overstate our current experience when we think about the future. Therefore, we tend to underestimate the problems that are going to occur. Does this ring a bell to anyone about the sprint plannings? <laughs> Good. Then we also misestimate. All of these um, reasons lead to 68% of the software projects failing. Moreover, uh, according to Accelerate, in low-performing teams, 31% of the time is spent on rework. If you, add, if you add the time that you're going to spend in meetings on top of that, that is going to leave you with half of your time spent on stuff that you thought it was done and you marked as done in your head. Now, what can we do about it? How can we ensure... Oh, no. <laughs> how can we ensure, uh, how can we lower the odds of your project failing? Or in other words, how can we more make your project suck a little bit less? This is the aim of today's talk. I'm going to talk about improving development quality and speed, as Monica mentioned. And whereas there are a lot of ways and reasons uh, why product projects are unsuccessful, one thing that successful projects have in common is effective agile testing, or effective testing in general. Before I can move into what tools and what experience I gathered and I would like to share with you, we would need to define what QA is in general. And Trish Chu gave a beautiful talk about transparency and the importance of transparency in um, the whole team approach to testing. She asked testers and developers what they were doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And this is the answers that she got from the testers. The testers said that they gather information, uh, check expectations versus reality, and diminish risks. This is something that I can totally identify with. However, you probably might identify better with this. This is the answers that she got from developers. 
um, work towards the team goal, looking for edge cases, or breaking the application. As you can see, those two don't quite match. They don't match to a degree that, for instance, looking for edge cases or breaking the application does not appear as the main goal of testers, whereas the risk and diminishing the risk does not appear in the answers of the developers. So I was confused, and when I'm confused, I'm asking Jailbird for life advice. And this is what I got. Right, so Dilver defined my, defines my job as overhead. It happens. <laughs> if you were to ask me about what quality assurance means and what quality assurance brings to the table, I would define it by this three areas or three hats that a quality a QA wears throughout the software development lifecycle. Now, first of all, the quality, anal uh, quality analyst, the quality assurer, and the quality ambassador. I think I, this was mute, but, well, no, I don't. <laughs> um, let's dive straight into what the quality anal analyst does. And that is the first hat. Um, this is the hat that I wear when I'm trying to figure out whether we're building the right product. In the context of a user story, the question looks more like this. Are we trying to solve a problem? And very often, in fact, way too often, we are diving straight into this question without understanding for whom we are trying to solve this problem. And this is where the data comes into play. And this is why data is so crucial when it comes to testing or development in general. So there are several sources of data that I find crucial. First one being the BI or business intelligence in general. When I started working at Freeletics, being a female, I assumed that half of our users are females. And usually the goal for a female would be to lose weight. So I created a bunch of test data, and I was like logging in with female users and going through our training flows. Little did I know that more than 70% of our users are male who are trying to gain muscle. Th this insight alone changed a lot the way that I was gathering that I would create test data in the future. Secondly, did it happen to any of you that a tester would block your release because the layout looks horrible in Russian? I know at least one developer because I did that myself. <laughs> and although I think Russian being the most beautiful language in the world deserves to look awesome in all of the screens and in all of the possible layouts, um, that's not necessarily always a priority. In the case of Freeletics, for instance, if we look at the data, our top five languages do not include Russian. Also, if you try to uh, filter it down to how many, how many of those users pay us money, the Russian, Russian is far behind. So understanding what languages our users are actually using was very helpful for me when testing layouts, especially on the smaller screens. And third, um, BI tells you what kind of devices and browsers the users are using. I still remember at Xing that we had to support IE9 for ages. And we had to do that because the majority of our users were using Xing on their workstations, where they were not admins. Therefore, they were not able to install a proper draft browser, right? And although that experience, especially with the Flexboxes, enriched a lot my swearing vocabulary, it also <laughs> empowered us to take better decisions when it came to testing and cross-browser testing in general. The second source of information is customer engagement or customer support. In the case of Freeletics, first of all, they give you this positive motivation to keep going, since we have so many users that would write us emotional emails about how Freeletics changed their life. Now, I understand that if you're sending fr selling fridges, you're probably not getting that, but you can still get the other two benefits, which is you can get the bugs that, you, that, they, come, that they bring through, but also, they give input in terms of the, um, the features that users misunderstand. For instance, I remember that when we started asking our customer support team at Xing about what people were expecting when pressing on a plus button, most of them were thinking about adding something to, a different, to an entity rather than creating an entity on itself. 
this information was very useful for our, for our designers. Also, the customer engagement team is very valuable in test sessions since they have so much test knowledge, product knowledge in general. And then there are the bugs. There are two things about the bugs. First of all, they tend to gather in areas where we have most technical depth. And especially if you're working with a product owner who's not very technical, showing him that this amount of bugs is going to be solved by this refactoring tends to be a way more compelling argument than the one that we are trying to make with developers in general. And secondly, the old bugs in the system usually tell us about areas that business doesn't care as much about. And that's probably something where the risk is lower, and it's very valuable to know since, um, since you can take better testing decisions and you can order your test cases and your test approach in a better way. Now, having all of this data, let's come back to the initial question. Do we solve a problem? Um, this is where we, if we understand for whom we're solving the problem, we can move to the next step, which is whether the problem is clear. Here we're talking about whether the user story is clear in itself, whether the acceptance criteria are clear, and whether a developer could actually imagine working on this story. From my experience, what helped a lot is to have a, an idea of what test scenarios are there to be tested. Not in a lot of detail, but at least to, first of all, make my role in the team a little bit clearer, so like people understand what I'm spending my time with, and also so that the testing effort gets estimated together in the, in the, size, in the sizing of the user story. Also, very often, developers would offer their help when it comes to complex, complex flows, and we would be able to write unit tests or like lower level tests before I can dive into exploratory testing. And third, we have how will the story add value? If we understand what the business wants to achieve, it can be easier for us to provide a simpler solution that it would still bring value to the users, and which would make our life easier implementing it. In order to understand these questions and visualize a little bit better, what helps is to have examples, mind maps, or functional tests. I'm going to give you an example that I used recently that uses a mind map. So to give you a little bit of context, at Freeletics, you have for ages, we had this system of training in which you had endless trainings. As in, every single week, you would complete the training that the coach assigned you, you would generate a new training, and then you would keep going, and the trainings would increase in complexity, you would get better, and there is no real end goal to that. Our product thought that having training journeys compared to this endless journey would be way better for the users. So you could have like a time frame of, let's say, six weeks in which you focus on gaining muscle, and then you would have a period, a longer period of time of, of let's say, 12 weeks in which you would cut and define that muscle. So we were at the point in which we wanted to validate this assumption with an A-B test. And this is how it looked like. Uh, for the sake of the presentation, I cut two-thirds of this mind map because it wouldn't have fit in the, in the slide. But I remember as we were draw drawing this with five engineers in the room, and I remember we started on, on a whiteboard, and as the thing was getting more and more complex, we needed more and more whiteboards. And by the end of it, we figured out that we are not only changing, making changes in our payment flow, we're also we are affecting the old users that we have, the user base that pays us, so the guys that we really care about. We're affecting the new users and the impact we're having on the market. We're also affecting the people who used to have a subscription and might want to start a new one. In other words, there was a huge risk in doing this A-B test. Now, understanding, we took a step back at that point, and we were like, OK, how can we bring the value that the business expects us to without having to go through this huge risk? Or how can we split this risk in smaller pieces? And what we did is we gathered the data that we had, and we were able to figure out that the people that had that the people that um, were new and had no subscription were able to provide us with sufficient statistically significant data so that we could run that test only on the people that didn't have a subscription. So instead of 
instead of doing all of this, we focused first on this, and we were able to sleep better and get, and get the data that we needed with a way simpler implementation. Moving forward, we have the quality assurer. This is the hat that is more driving the testing effort. And I'm going to spare you the whole uh, testing pyramid thing, and I'm going to focus on the testing goals. And usually, I would divide, divide the testing in two parts, like the testing goals in two parts. The tests that support the team, that help us move faster and better, and the tests that criticize the product. So the tests that actually bring us most of the bugs. In most of the teams that I've been in, we would focus on this part, and we would neglect the tests that support the team because those tests were not in place, like the unit tests were not in place. I, as a tester, would spend most of my time testing the happy path, which was not working. Thereas, I was now able to focus on the more intrinsic tests, on the more complex one, and actually find those edge cases that we were missing. So, except that, let's talk about a little bit about exploratory testing. This is what I spend most of my time with. This is where we found most of our bugs. Um, and I think, although exploratory testing from a testing perspective is extremely useful, uh, having a team approach to that is very helpful from the perspective of that we would get way more a sense of accomplishment for the developers and also way more insights that on, than only my two eyes. In order to organize it with the developers so that they can identify em and empathize, I found that personas are really useful. Let's say we would have Jack, the training junkie, who is training six times a week, who is training very actively, who is looking for total mus muscle exhaustion, versus Mafusail, who, let's say, is older, uh, who wants a training that doesn't put too much pressure on his joints, and he wants to just keep active. And you have Mary, the young mom who basically has 20 minutes to train. All of these three users come from actual data. We have these three profiles. And giving these personas to users, to our team members, empowers them to empathize and test the application from a perspective that they don't normally have, because they all have their own way of training themselves. Also, to push it a little bit further, giving some test idea, these are some that we are using that in our application yielded bugs in the past, but you could just grab some that would be relevant for your application. So for instance, notifications was something that we very often forget. Having notifications in mind when organizing a test session is very valuable because you're able to not only see the perspective of this specific persona, but also see the complexity of the story around it. Moving into the third part, that is the quality ambassador. It's basically the part in which I am trying to sell this idea of quality to more people in my team so that more people are wearing this quality hats, let's say. And what I learned to be very useful was to have a quality goal. So if I am asking the developers, what do you think would be the most meaningful thing that we can do in the next, let's say, six to nine months in order to drastically increase the quality of our product, um, we are able to define one common goal that we can continue pursuing throughout the day-to-day -day development. In our case, that is to increase our confidence in releases. So every time we're implementing a new story, we keep in mind that we want to achieve this goal in six to nine months. Therefore, we are thinking way more in terms of testability. The fact that we have a quality goal in mind helps us um, visualize our progress better and also helps people be on board. Also, having information radiators with those KPIs that we defined as relevant um, is very helpful to understand where we stand. And if we're doing good, we can celebrate, and if we're doing bad, we can organize a post-mortem. Um, I remember the first time that I did a post-mortem. Uh, I was, to be honest, quite, first of all, euphoric, because I had read the site reliability engineering, and I was like, whoa, we're going to do a post-mortem, it's going to be awesome. And then the opportunity came, and I was terrified, because it was very clear who created the problem in the system. There was already some tension in the room, 
with regards to that person. It was the first post-mortem that we did. I remember that I was scared that we would go into um, blaming and that would, we wouldn't be able to talk about solutions and s solutions and improvements instead of just blaming this dude for making a small mistake. And I focused the conversation into three parts, like what went well, and usually there's always something that goes well, that makes the whole conversation, that frames the con conversation in a way more positive way. Then what went wrong, and here we would talk about the incident without blaming the person, and then how to avoid it. Here we would spend most of the time thinking about solutions and possible improvements for the future. Now, what does this all stuff mean for you? I gave you a couple of ideas and techniques that I've used that I hope you could apply in your own environment that would help you to improve the speed and to um, improve the quality. So first of all, gather data, um, ensure that you're pair testing when writing those unit tests, have examples and personas so you can identify with people, organize postmortems when you screw up, and have the exploratory sessions together with the team. The story mapping together with like having test case scenarios at the level when defining the user story allows to diminish the risk on the lo long term and also helps the team see that, that testing effort moving from one side to another. And to conclude, I would like to leave you with this. Quality is never an accident. It's always a result of intelligent effort. Thank you. Yeah, uh, does anyone have questions? I'll be glad to take them. I have a question, and it is, uh, how, do you uh, how do you convince developers that quality is also there? I mean, that they can be an active part in building quality in their product, and it's not like something that they sort of outsource to QA, for example? That's a very tricky one. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, that's what I spend most of my time with. Um, what I noticed is that if you give them a quality goal in mind, that is that helps them uh, see where they're where going towards, whereas not only looking at the small bugs that are in the user story as of now, and try to focus more on the long term. And also, developers tend to care, from what I learned, about the code that they write. If you act a little bit from my perspective on pride, and you try to develop a pride for what we are developing and for the project that we have, people tend to care more and more about quality. And the reminders are very helpful. As I noticed like in the very beginning when I was in the refinement sessions and I was asking a lot of questions in order to clarify the acceptance criteria, I was the only one doing that. And then over time, I noticed that developers started seeing value in those questions, and they started asking them themselves. So I think providing an example and providing a quality goal would be probably the two things that I would try doing. Anything else? Awesome. We can still have a beer after it afterwards. Thank you. Thank you all. This is Thank for you. you. <laughs> Thank you.